Um, I'm Jennifer Fletcher, and then my other two co-hosts that will be answering questions later on is Amy Costa and Andy Manuel, and we work in a special department in Alpine and just help with some children who have some issues with behavior. All right, so behavior basics. It's not going to let me, there we go. All right, so some objectives that we want are looking forward to for tonight is one, just being able to understand the ABCs of behavior. Two, to be able to apply the ABCs of behavior in order to identify a function of behavior. And you're going to get to apply that to one of your own children's behaviors. And then select a possible strategy that you can hopefully go, go and try with your child. So I wanna start off with some ABA definition. Uh, there's a lot of misconceptions about what ABA is. A lot of times people will think that ABA means, you, you know, it's just going to the clinic and doing discrete trial. But ABA is the science that we use for behavior change in order to improve the quality of life for the kids that we work with. And we do that by identifying specific factors to help us make decisions on how to make some of the, those behavior changes. So it's really, it's really a science of behavior change. So we're gonna start off with the ABCs. So when we're looking, thinking about the ABCs, that's the antecedent, the behavior, and the consequences. Wait a minute. Hang on, sorry, my computer is, there we go. Okay, got it. <laughs> Let's go back. So ABA tends to focus on observable behaviors, skill acquisition, and then environmental factors that maintain the target behavior. So the functional behavior. So we're going to talk about that as we go. Now we're going to get to the ABCs of behavior. So with the, when you're looking at behaviors, you want to know your ABCs. Really understanding what the ABCs of behavior are will help you know how to best teach your child new behaviors, replacement behaviors, and just be able to help them um, improve their quality of life and hopefully improve quality of life for yourself as you help them learn how to better deal with their behaviors. So the very first uh, stage to look at is A, which is antecedents, which is what happens immediately before a specific behavior happens. Um, and immediately is really the key. So let's say, for example, that your child is aggressive and tends to hit. If your child comes home from school, drops backpack and coat on the floor, and then you say, hey, wait, you gotta put, hang your stuff up, but then they run off into the kitchen and get into the fridge. So you follow them into the kitchen and you say, go hang up your coat and backpack. And then you close the refrigerator door and then he starts hitting you. So when you were thinking about the antecedent, there's a lot of different things you can, um, a lot of things that we have a tendency to think about, sometimes think, well, did he have a really hard day at school? Or um, is it because we asked him to hang up his coat and backpack? But you have to really think in that scenario, what happened right before that behavior of hitting happened? And that in this case is that you closed the refrigerator door. Maybe he was trying to get a snack. And so he got upset because he wanted to be able to get the food out of the refrigerator. Then a lot of times, like I mentioned with the, uh, with there's something that happened at school or on the bus, things like that. Those can be called setting events. Those are things that might make the behavior more likely to happen. And those, but those are things that we can talk about and think about in a different training at some other time. So main key here is what happened immediately before that behavior happened. The B is behavior. And you wanna make sure that it's something that is observable and measurable. So this is the behavior response uh, to the antecedent. And it's something that you can measure, whether it's how many times did the child hit? How long did they cry for? What was the intensity? Was it just a mild eh, kind of hit? Or was it like a closed fist kind of hit where they're hitting really hard? And then the C of ABCs is the consequence. So with consequence, just like the antecedent, it's what happened immediately after that behavior has happened. So what, when you're thinking of the consequence, what is that child getting for the behavior? So, and sometimes the behavior may continue. So maybe they're gonna cry and cry and cry for a while. So then you have to wait until after the behavior finishes before you really see what that consequence is because there's that possibility that even though you may reprimand the child and tell them, no, you can't have that, do, does something happen where they get that, what they wanted in the end? 
in which case that's what the consequence is. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about that and make that clear with an example. So in ex this example with the fridge, closing the fridge, if he screams and he hits and eventually you just walk away, the consequence was that you walked away, he opened the fridge again. So he was able to get into and get into the food. So for this presentation, I really want you to think about a challenging behavior because in order to really take in this, the information, it's good to kind of apply it in your own life. So I'm gonna give you one minute, think about a challenging behavior that you wanna focus on during this presentation. And then I want you to keep that behavior in mind throughout the rest of the presentation. So I'll give you one minute to think of a behavior and try to think of a behavior that will be a little easier to address. Don't think of the hardest, challenge, most challenging behavior because then you're just gonna get frustrated with that. So what challenging behavior do you wanna think of? Okay, so hopefully you have a behavior in mind. And go ahead and move on. I have some examples here of looking at behaviors in the ABC format. And this is also another way that you can format um, for keeping ABC data. So when your child is having a behavior, you can start documenting at home and write down what the antecedents uh, was, what the behavior is and what are the consequences. And I don't know if the link is, there yet on the parent, um, the Utah Parent Center yet or not, but it should be there hopefully in the next few days. So let's take a look at these example behaviors. The first one, the parent tells the child to put away the iPad. This one's a pretty common one where kids don't like to put away the iPad or they like to play on your phone. So the child screams, I'm not done and keeps playing or maybe they just scream. And then the consequence is that the parent lets the child keep playing. So in this case, a child gets to avoid having to stop playing. Okay, for the second one, parent goes into the kitchen. Child follows the parent and says, cookie. Parent gives the child a cookie, so the child gains tangible. So because the child said cookie, they gained a tangible. And this one here too, because the child screamed, they got to keep playing. Okay, for this behavior, See, uh, the sibling is playing with friends. The child runs into the bedroom where they're at and runs and hits the sibling. The consequence was that the sibling screams and starts chasing after the child. In this case, even though it was a negative behavior, the child gains the attention from their sibling. And then this final one, child is left alone in a room while parent goes into another room. Then the behavior is begins to push on their eye with their finger. And some kids like to do that. They push on the little corner of their eye, which helps stimulate some of the lights that appear within their eye. And the consequence was they got to have those lights appear, which is an automatic, or sometimes um, it can be, can be considered uh, sensory. And we'll talk more about automatic, exactly what that is in a little bit, but they get something out of it, some sort of bodily function out of it. Okay, so we're gonna watch this video and I like this video because when you're watching it, you can kind of see that ABC format that they're filling it in. This is a, you know, a dad at home trying to figure out why their child is jumping. So hopefully it's gonna start. It's not. This is Tom and his five-year-old son, Ethan. Ethan has autism and sometimes engages in behaviors he doesn't understand. Tom has been working with a BCBA to help him understand Ethan's behavior since sometimes the behavior is pretty unsafe. The BCBA works with Tom to choose a behavior to target first. They decide they want to understand Ethan's jumping since this behavior poses the greatest risk to safety. She asks him to collect ABC data. 
the BCBA explains that the antecedent is what happens right before the behavior. The behavior is whatever Ethan does that we want to learn more about. And the consequence is what happens immediately after the behavior. She tells him not to get fancy or write too much. Just keep it simple. The first opportunity for Tom to collect ABC data occurred one night when Tom was making dinner. Ethan was in the other room watching TV, so Tom wasn't sure what happened. Rather than write down that he wasn't watching Ethan, he decided maybe the antecedent was him making dinner. Although Tom didn't see what started it, he could clearly see as Ethan launched himself from the couch. This was the behavior they were trying to learn more about. Tom responded the way he always did when Ethan engaged in frustrating behavior. Although he's not proud of it, he yelled at Ethan to stop. He really just needed to get food on the table so they could finish with the rest of their routine. Tom made a note on the ABC data sheet the BCBA left behind for him. He wrote down the antecedent behavior and consequence, then set the paper aside until the behavior happened again. The next opportunity came at bedtime that night. Tom tucked Ethan in as he always did and then walked away. The behavior this time was Ethan jumping off the bed. Tom rushed in when he heard the noises coming from Ethan's room. Seeing Ethan perched precariously on the edge of his bed, Tom instinctively yelled, stop. Once he has Ethan settled in bed again, he heads to the kitchen and jots down what happened. He's ready for bed himself, but decides that this is worth the minute it takes to make the note. The third incident happened when Tom was sitting at his desk filling out some paperwork for Ethan's school. He only needed a minute, but it seems as though that's all it takes. In this incident, Ethan jumped off the bookcase in Tom's office. Tom's not quite sure how he managed to scale it in such a short amount of time, but Ethan sailed off the top of the bookcase as Tom watched in horror. This incident again had Tom yelling for Ethan to stop jumping. Tom recognized this as the consequence in this situation. When Ethan was busy playing with his trains, Tom took a minute to jot down what happened on the ABC data sheet. He now had enough data to see a pattern emerging. This would help him understand why Ethan jumped and help the BCBA know what to do to change the behavior. Okay, so I, when we look at this ABC, and this is something too, even if it's not on the parent center, um, uh, if you can't find it on the Utah Parent Center, you can do a Google search and find EBC reporting data, or just take a piece of paper and just draw three, you know, make three columns where you have your antecedent, your behavior, and your consequence. And then just really think about what immediately happens before that behavior, what immediately happens after that behavior. And then we're going to actually talk here, but just for now, just as this person um, did it, or as Tom did it, he cooked dinner, jumped off the couch, and then just immediately what happened afterwards, Tom told Ethan to stop. And it's the same thing with each of these. The bed, and then Tom comes back in to tell Ethan to stop jumping. Uh, fill up the paperwork, jumps off the bookcase, Tom tells Ethan to stop. So you probably can already start thinking about what are the possible functions of this behavior? But it's really good to make sure that you are really you're noting down what happens immediately before and immediately after. All right. So think about the behavior that you have selected. When we are looking at and trying to figure out how to make this behavior change, we look at the antecedents. And we see, okay, is there a pattern to what's happening immediately before that behavior? What happens most often? Is it they're asked to do something? Is it um, they're uh, someone walks away, like in the example? Or is it sibling gets attention from somebody? So maybe mom's talking to brother. 
there's a lot of different things that you can that can cause behavior. It's just getting good at really pinpointing and seeing the, the patterns of behavior, what is happening right before that behavior. And then with behavior, you wanna make sure that you really define what that behavior looks like to any observer. So anybody who is looking at that behavior knows exactly what you're talking about. So there is a, I, and maybe I should have put that in, but there, when you, I, one of the things I like to do is I ask people, what does a tantrum exactly look like? And a tantrum can be different from child to child. So maybe you have one child who tantrums by just kind of throwing themselves down on the floor and crying. Or you might have another child that likes to jump up and down and stomp and scream at the top of their lungs. So you want to make sure you know exactly what that behavior looks like, just in case the child hits, but it's just kind of like a playful hit versus they're actually slugging hitting so that you know what you want to be recording for. Because if they're just doing a playful hit, maybe that's not something that we're worried about. But if they're actually causing physical harm to somebody else, we want to make sure we're keeping track of that. And then with the consequences, thinking about what happens immediately after the behavior. So I'm going to give you a minute and I want you to just kind of brainstorm right now. Think about that behavior you chose and I know you don't have any data right now, but this is just kind of a little practice. Start thinking about what antecedents do you think tend to happen before the behavior? What exactly does that behavior look like? And what tends to happen immediately after the behavior? And it wants you to actually start taking data and looking at it. It may be different, but this is just good to start thinking. And definitely after you keep your ABC data, you can start, you can ask these questions again. Okay. All right, so now that once we have our ABCs down, we wanna start figuring out what's causing, what's the maintaining function of that behavior? What is it that's happening? What's this consequence? What are they getting out of this behavior that makes it so that they wanna keep engaging into, in it? So there are four functions of behavior. The first one is attention and attention, well, we'll I'll, we we'll kind of talk about that, but basically getting it from anybody, whether it's from you or for someone else. You also have escape, if they're escaping a task or avoiding a task or avoiding having to do something they don't want to do, such as put something away or even avoiding another person. Access to tangibles. Tangibles are things that you can hold or have, such as eating something, an iPad's a tangible, a toy, and an automatic sensory stimulation. So let's look at those in more depth. So for the attention, the child engages in behavior in order to receive attention from those within the environment. And that can be parents, teachers, siblings, peers, just basically anybody that's there, other family members. And then the attention func functions as the reinforcer because it helps, because it causes that child's behavior to increase in order to get the attention. All behavior is learned. So at some point in your child's history, if it's attention-based, that means that they've cried, they've gotten attention. And that's what babies learn to do. They learn to cry. You pick them up or you feed them and they learn to start differentiating. Oh, if I do this, then I'm going to get my mom's attention or my dad's attention or whoever, whatever family members in there. So they've done, they've engaged in the behavior in the past. They've gotten attention out of it. So for example, Johnny screams every instance that his mother walks away from him. When he engages in this behavior, his mother returns to him and asks, what's wrong, Johnny? This behavior is attention maintained because behavior constantly results in attention. So whenever Johnny wants attention, he's learned, I'm going to scream. And kids get really good with, with all these different functions. If it works really well, they may stay, say something, may do a little whine, but eventually, if it gets reinforced enough, they may instantly go straight to whatever that extreme behavior is in order to get it because they know it works fast. 
So just something to be aware about with attention is it doesn't have to always be positive attention. Unpleasant um, examples will include if you're giving reprimands, telling them, no, that's not okay to do that. Or you start explaining, okay, we don't do this because in giving them lots not to talk, they're getting the attention, even if it's a negative um, experience. And I know it seems kind of weird that kids will crave even negative attention, but that's just one of the funny things about behavior is positive and negative attention. If kids want attention, then both ways, they'll, they'll engage in behavior in order to get either. All right, one of the other functions of behavior is escape or avoidance. So this is when a child engages in the behavior in order to get out of something they don't want to do. So learned behavior in the past, the child is engaged in the behavior, meaning that they've done something and that task has been removed or that request has been removed. And so they've learned if I do this, I won't have to do it anymore. So they'll, they're more likely to increase in that behavior in order to escape or avoid whatever work or request that's being given them. So for example, every time Johnny's father puts homework in front of him, he rips up the paper and throws it on the floor. As a result, Johnny's father does not make him do his homework. So in the future, Johnny continues to engage in this behavior every time he receives a homework paper because it results in escaping the behavior of doing homework. Uh, this one is a, probably a very common one that you'll run into within the home. That's something that when I taught, I had lots of parents would ask me, well, how do I get my child to do homework? Because every time we do, they cry or they run to the room and there's lots of different kinds of behavior you can engage in in order to avoid getting to do that work. There are, there's some things to remember, a little note about that. Um, one is you have to be careful because there is that course of uh, cycle. And if you haven't ever read the tough kid, uh, the tough kid book, they have a tough kid book for parents that has some really good tips and tricks in there as well and explains some of the behaviors and some ideas of things of how to overcome those behaviors. So, and just think if you've gone through this or not with any of your children or any students you may have worked with. So you have the parent or the teacher and they give a request like, wouldn't you like to, or please do this. And the child ignores you. So this is the child who's trying to escape or avoid doing a task. So if I do it at home, maybe saying, when, you know, wouldn't you like to go clean your room or please go clean your room? And the child, it just ignores you, keeps on playing their video game. Then you have the parent teacher says, come on, please. And start trying to cajole them and come on, we, you, you just go, please clean your room. And the child kind of lays like, oh, doesn't really want to do it. Kind of keeps playing their video game or doing whatever it is that they're doing. And then we have this tendency to get into where it's like, okay, we're getting frustrated. They're not listening. And we start threatening and, and saying, doing the reprimands, you better do it. It's time. You need to go clean your room right now. And so things get a little bit more aggressive. The child may begin to start making excuses. Like, come on, I just have to finish this game. I'm one more level to go. Or they start arguing and saying, my room's not that dirty or I'll clean it up tomorrow. Things like that. Then you have, then it tends to escalate a little bit more. And it's like, okay, now you've had it. I'm going to take away your phone and, <coughs> excuse me, or some other privilege, or I'm going to put away your game, or you try to go over and take the controller away. And then you have the behavior where they tantrum and they become aggressive, um, whether they throw them, start screaming and yelling, or they become aggressive and start hitting. And then it gets to be too much. So we say, okay, you know what? Never mind. I, I'll just get your room clean for you, or you can just do it tomorrow. And so they stop tantruming and they go back to playing their game. One of the problems with this coercive cycle, or sometimes it's called the pain cycle, is once the pain of you request, or you know, once you withdraw the request, it's reinforcing to you because then the pain of what they're doing also stops. But then it becomes this whole cycle where it continues and continues and then become, they become even better at avoiding tasks. And one of the worst things that tends to happen with this cycle is that 
you will they'll get to the point if it keeps working where they get to escape and avoid constantly through this cycle they'll you'll get to the point where the parent or the teacher would say hey please go clean your room and they'll immediately jump up to here and start having right here and start having their tantrum or become an aggressive because they learn that that stops behavior and they just want you to stop faster so something to be aware of and then we will talk about another note so when you're thinking about escape maintain behavior there you have to also be aware and check and make sure that it's not due to a lack of motivation to perform the task so you know that's just something they don't want to do so like with cleaning the room that's usually something that it's just hard they don't want to do i my daughter really hated i have a daughter with uh, asperger syndrome and that was the thing that she hated to do was clean her room um we had many many struggles with that for quite a few years until i figured out a trick to help her with it and then the other thing to think about and this happens a lot in school or maybe we just think they should know how to do something but they really don't know how to do it where that some sort of skill is just too difficult for them to do. And so if it's really hard to do, a lot of kids, for example, with autism struggle with handwriting skills. And so there's a lot, I've seen a lot of behavior that had escape behavior due to the fact that they really don't know how to write very well. It's a big struggle, it's very difficult. So it just is not reinforcing enough for them to comply with a task to write a sentence out. So when you have some of these issues, if you're aware of it and you can compensate for it, sometimes that will help with escape behaviors. All right, access to tangibles. Oh, one thing I forgot to uh, mention with the coercive cycle that when it, um, when it happens at school, and a student's compliance to adult request falls, falls below 40%, that's enough to disable a student. So that's the same, just something to be aware about. If, if you have a child that struggles with that, that's something that we try to avoid because most students tend to comply with about 80% of requests within a school setting. So it is important to stop that behavior before it begins. Um, all right. So access to tangible. Oops. The child engages in the behavior, in this behavior, in order to get something that they prefer. So probably at home, you see a lot of the iPad and the iPhones that they tend to want to get. So when the child is engaged in this behavior in the past, it usually results in them being able to get an item or an activity that they want to do. Um, the item or activity is a reinforcer because it increases that likelihood that they're going to scream or cry or hit in the order to get access to whatever it is that they want. So for example, when Stevie cries, his mother gives uh, him her phone to play on. So in the future, Stevie cries because it consistently results in access to his mother's phone. And this gets really hard too, especially when you're out in public and you have children who, who like to scream and cry in order to get something. And so sometimes it is much easier to just get your child to be quiet so you don't get those looks or it can be kind of embarrassing to have a child throw a fit. And so we just kind of give in on those things <laughs> sometimes. Um, it's life is life. I, my daughter, um, we had a really hard time taking her to the store because she liked to have a lot of tantrums in order to get tangibles and it is, it is very difficult when they you get those looks of why is your child screaming and I had one time because I I have five children my I have my daughter with Asperger syndrome my youngest two who have autism and we just had a really big meltdown with her and at the same time the other two decided that they were going to go run off and try to go do other things and anyway I got asked to leave Walmart and that was very embarrassing <laughs> Um, but that is definitely something that we worked on. So even though things can be very difficult, it's at least try working on them in the home as much as you can. So, and then we can slowly work on things out in the, out in the community as you can. All right. So one note about access is access maintained behavior maybe simply the child gesturing towards something. So maybe they would like to 
uh, uh, or they're pointing toward, towards it. Um, maybe if they are uh, have limited communication, maybe they just try to go over to the area. Maybe they don't gesture, but they walk over by the cabinet where something is kept, or they walk by the TV, or it could be something that's a lot more problematic, like the whining or throwing or hitting. So access maintained behaviors don't just have to be the really negative behaviors. All right, so let's talk about automatic. So automatically reinforced behavior that reinforces itself. So it's maintained based upon the response in the child's body as experienced through sensory input. It's something that feels really good to them. It gives them some type of, of pleasure, whether it tastes really good or it's something that's comforting or maybe something that relieves pain. Um, there's, I've seen some kids where they've had pain in their jaws from teeth issues. And so they, they would hit themselves in the face over and over again. Um, and it turned out that they had some, some teeth that needed to be taken care of, or even some head hitting. Sometimes that's been caused because they have headaches, but they aren't able to let us know because of limited communication. Um, I, pushing the eye creates little lights. You see the kids that do the hand flapping. When you see those kinds of things, then just think about what's going on within the environment. So my example here is Stevie engages in hand flapping regardless of who or what is in the environment. So this behavior provides the automatic uh, sensory stimulation. And another word for this is when they do the hand flapping and they're, they're doing a lot of the um, repetitive body motions is called stereotopy. So you, you might have hand flapping, body rocking, toe walking, uh, spinning objects, uh, sniffing. I had a student who loved to sniff hair. That was something that was, he lo just loved the smell of people's hair and they're smelling their shampoo. Um, sometimes you have the immediate and delayed echolalia. So maybe you, you hear e, 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 e. There's just, you know, one sound they like to make over and over and over again. And just something about that sound is really pleasant to them. Or you have kids that like to, they, they catch on to some little Disney phrase and they say it over and over again. I had my son used to say infinity and beyond and jump off the couch. And he just did that over and over and over again. He just loved doing that. Or sometimes you have some stereotypy where kids like to run something across their peripheral vision. They just like seeing it on the side there and it just creates some type of pleasure for them. When you're thinking about automatic stimulation, also think about what it is that you do, because we all do things that provide some sort of nice feeling um, response within our body. So are you a hair twirler or maybe you like to chew gum, tap your, your fingers, you know, sometimes people will do that on the, on the table, tapping their finger, their pencils. We just all, we all have some type of repetitive motion that we do. It just may not be quite as obvious and big as some of our kids may engage into. So something to think about is what do you do? I had, I did a parent training night years and years ago on sensory input. And it's really fun because I have this little, this little survey of what adults tend to participate in for sensory types of things. And so this gentleman was going through and marking off all the things that he did. And he's a, he was a leg bouncing his legs and he did a lot of tapping. And it was funny because after he filled that out, he's like, Oh, wait a minute. My son's just like me. He just does it more. And it was kind of funny because I've been watching him and yeah, he, he really engaged in the same kind of stereotypy as his son did, but his son, his son was just a little bit more intense. A little note about stereotypy or automatic reinforcement. And so some behaviors that look like our self-harm, like I mentioned, where they're like hitting your jaw, hitting your head against the table or against the floor, there sometimes, and my experience has been that quite often that there's some type of internal cause, especially when you have a child who has limited communication where they can't tell you what's going on. So it's always a good idea to make sure if you have a child that's doing some type of self-interest behavior like that, 
that you rule out any type of medical issues that they could have, whether it's maybe they need to get their teeth checked or maybe there's some sort of, they're having some pain somewhere or one that, um, one child that I know of ended up having a vitamin deficiency. And so they weren't getting enough of the vitamins that they needed within their system. And that was causing some major pains within them. But I always like to rule that, try to, to rule that out first. Also, the other note with it is that not all of the automatic behavior needs to be changed. So when you're thinking about wanting to change some type of automatic uh, behavior that your child's maybe participating in, does it really affect their quality of life? That's what you wanna think about because if they just like to do some hand flapping, but it's not causing them any injury, it's not causing anybody else any, any injury, is it really necessary to try to fix that behavior? Does it really need to be changed? And. The other thing to think about too is not all stereotype, stereotypy is necessarily automatic as well. So maybe, let me think of a, um, student that I worked with that used to do a lot of the, some of the noises and stuff. He, he was a little bit more vocal, but he always was making some of these noises but it turned out for him that he just wasn't drinking enough water. So once we got him a water bottle, it was, it was this took a while to figure out, but once he had a, a water bottle and started drinking the water, the noises just disappeared. So for him, he, he just wasn't getting enough, I, I think oral stimulation for his mouth and, and maybe he was just thirsty and his mouth was feeling kind of funky. All right, so in this video, we're gonna move on a little bit. Now that we've talked about the four different functions of behavior. I want you to watch this video and kind of watch for the function of behavior in this clip. I want you to think what is, why is the boy behaving in this behavior that he is engaging in? Give me some ice cream. I want some ice cream now. No, we just had supper. And remember, I told you no ice cream or Coke if you didn't eat your supper. And I don't like bossy talk. Give me some ice cream now. Why can't I have some ice cream? I want some ice cream. Well, just this once. I'll see if we have any. Yes, we have some. No. Yeah, I want Okay. So just think about our different functions of behavior. Is it access, automatic, escape, attention, tangible? I'll let you think that through your, to yourself. You can write it into the chat if you want to and we'll see what you think. All right, so in that case, it was access to tangible. When he screamed, and even though she at first told him no, he kept he continued on with the behavior. So the consequence for him is that he got to have the ice cream, then he engaged in the behavior again, and then he was able to get the Coke that he wanted. So it was definitely access to tangible for that one. Oh, and I forgot I had my slide here. so. Anyway, those are the <laughs> those are the functions of behaviors again. 
Okay, so what I want you to do now is think about the behavior you thought of earlier and think about what, just make a hypothesis of what you think the function of that behavior might be. What could your child be getting out of engaging in the particular behavior you chose? Okay, hopefully you had a chance to think of it. Let's talk about some ideas of things about how to deal with some challenging behavior. So one of the first things that I like to think about that I always like to consider is, is there some type of replacement communication skill that needs to be put into place? And depending on your child's communication level, they might be able to use vocal speech or you might wanna use different devices and you have high tech and low tech, um, uh, high tech and low tech communication devices that you can use. So you, you could create a communication board. I have a nephew right now who um, his mom is put together just a picture of the fruit pouches that he likes put on the fridge so that he could at least start tapping it to let her know that that's what he wants instead of engaging in screaming communication. High tech things such as using an iPad, um, low tech, using picture exchange communication system, which is where you have pictures of preferred items and they learn to give it to you to ask for things. My youngest son, we had to do that. We just started one, one thing, which was milk, his favorite thing and teaching him how to give me that picture of milk whenever he wanted it. And I also did teach him how to do some sign language with it as well. And so he would, he, he learned to sign it. So once he learned this, and we taught him a bunch of different signs for that, for cheese. And since I knew some sign language, that was easy for me. So he would start signing that, but I always then paired it with the verbal. And eventually he was able to start communicating and he would sign and say the word at the same time. So when you think about communication skills, they, the communication skills can really help develop a skill that replaces that negative behavior, especially if they're trying to gain access to some type of tangible. Um, so for example, if the child hits to get access to food and he's taught to ask, ask for a snack, the hitting will most likely go away. If they have some better way to communicate, usually it tends to go, to go away. I um, have been working with a student who, who has had very limited communication and we taught him just to be able to start using some pecs. And it's amazing just how that we see the behavior line go down and down and down to where he's hardly ever engaging in negative aggressive behaviors because he has a new way that's easier for him to be able to request what he wants. So here's an example. A child screams or hits during homework time. He wants to avoid schoolwork. Instead of getting upset by the challenging behavior, try to teach him to replace the behavior with a more proactive communication. So in this case, we're gonna teach him to communicate how, that he wants a break. So the parent says, if you're too tired to keep working, you can ask for a break. And this is where it's nice. I like to have like a little break card to use as a visual cue. And so the child says break or the child gives the break card. The parent says, okay, let's take a one minute break from work. So during the break, he can play with a toy or watch a video or pet the cat. After that, you remind him that it's time to work again. But when he's done, he can earn iPad time. This is extremely motivating for him and he can ask for more breaks until the work is done. So it is very important with this when you're trying to teach him communication. He's not, this in this case, it, the function of the behavior is avoidance. He wants to get out of doing homework. So we're not letting him get out of homework completely, but we're teaching him instead of engaging in hitting, he can go take a break, come back, do a little bit more, take a break, come back, do a little bit more. So he's learning to, to communicate that he needs a break instead of hitting. So that's the replacement behavior. And then over time, this is something that you, you don't get end up being stuck with. 
you know, like maybe he'll work for one minute and then he takes a one minute break, works for one minute, takes a one minute break, but eventually you can fade it out and start saying something. Sure, you can get a break as soon as we do this next problem. And you just help build up his work tolerance to eventually they get used to it and maybe you don't need to ask for that break quite as often. Another example. So we have a girl, she uses challenging behaviors to get goldfish crackers. And she screams and she throws a tantrum every time because she wants those goldfish crackers. So one way to help her give her replacement behavior for her screaming is to show her a picture of the goldfish to the girl and say goldfish. And in this case is a child who can't say very much, but she can make the sound guh. So she touches the pictures and says guh. And then you just say goldfish, sure, you can have some. And you give her a few goldfish. So just you want to keep the picture nearby in the kitchen and just keep reinforcing her for touching the picture and asking for the goldfish. And then if she independently touches that picture without any behavior, then, you know, so once she gets it, once your child understands, oh, if I do this and I don't have to, you know, you don't have to show them to do it, you want to give them a little bit bigger reward for doing that independently on their own. So it's a really big positive praise for them, which gives them a little bit more encouragement to continue it, uh, engaging in that that behavior. And this is something too, where you can teach them to sign as well. Maybe you teach them to do fish. All right. So alternative replacement behaviors, they, they're a new behavior that serves the same function, same purpose as the problem behavior. So if it's, if your child is engaging in hitting because they want to get out of homework, then you wanna do something to teach them how to escape in a better way. Or if they're hitting because they're trying to get a tangible, then think about what can I do to help them have a better way to communicate or a better behavior to get that tangible. So when you think of the alternative behavior, it, it gives a child a chance to receive and maintain something in a very socially appropriate and functional way. And then you, you teach them to engage that replacement behavior rather than the problem behaviors under similar circumstances. So think about the behavior that, you, that you're thinking of tonight. And if you were able to identify one of the functions, a function of the behavior, is there some type of replacement behavior that would be good that you could use? And this is sometimes hard, hard to think about. And even when you try something out, even when I work with kids with behaviors, I'll try something, I think it's gonna work great. And sometimes it just doesn't work great. And I got to figure out a, a better way to do it or a different way to do it. And that's okay. It's trial and error. I, raising my children with, with autism, they, there was a lot of trial and error and a lot of learning and, thing, and trying things in order to help them overcome some of the challenging behaviors that they had. Um, some ideas. I've already mentioned the break card um, and gaining access. Sometimes for like an automatic, where like with the child who likes to push on the corner of their eyes to see the lights, I've used a light up toy before and put that in the peripheral. So instead of pushing their eye, we just would, you know, put that there instead to help try to provide that same stimulation if we could, because they like the lights. Um, oh, there's a lot, of, a lot of different ideas. Being able to push the button on the iPad, to let you know that they're not feeling good, things like that. All right, there's some additional ideas that we can talk about uh, re using reinforcement. I like using reinforcement token boards for a lot of things. So especially with homework, it's really nice because then they can see just how far they have to go, how many more tasks or how many stars I need to go. And you also have the thing where you're reminding them, what am I working for? I'm, in this case, it looks like a, working for Cheetos. And even if they're having to engage in a break, you know, maybe you're reinforcing them for asking for that break. So they do a little bit of work, they ask for a break. Hey, thanks for doing work and, and then asking for your break. Here's a star. 
and they come back, they do a little bit more work, they ask for a break, you can just continue and give them those stars until the end and then eventually fade those out. Um, I have some kids that get very motivated to use token boards because it's something that's tailored to something that they enjoy. So Steve McQueen, you have all sorts of different little tokens here that you can use. Sometimes some kids just like the idea, it's their favorite characters. And so it helps build that excitement to use the board and to be willing to do a little bit more to get that token because they like Steve, Steve McQueen. Um, or they like SpongeBob and like the different characters from SpongeBob. So they get to put, use those little Squidward and um, Patrick and SpongeBob himself on a board in order to earn what they want. Or maybe they want iPad time and they really love to use iPad. So you have little pictures of the iPad on here if you want to, and then have, have that reward at the top. You can also just use pennies. It doesn't have to be anything fancy. You can use little gems. You have the craft. If you like to do crafting, sometimes there's those little gems. Kids sometimes, especially a lot of girls, really like the little gems because they're sparkly. Have some boys that like that too. Um, all right. Antecedent strategies. So antecedent strategies are things that we like to do before a behavior starts in order to reduce the likelihood that that behavior is going to start. So you're trying to put something in place before you even get to the ABCs that will hopefully keep the behavior from happening when A happens. So for example, um, if, you're, if the child, when they get home from school is hungry, kind of going back to our example before, then before we try to get them to go put away all their backpack and everything, maybe that's just, uh, you put that into your little routine. They come home, maybe they drop their stuff on the floor and they have learned, you teach them to request a snack first. Um, and then once they've eaten, now they're more likely to go pick up their coat in their backpack because they're no longer hungry. Uh, of course, when you're presenting and your, your mind goes blank of all the different examples that are out there. But as we go along, I'm sure I'll think some more. <laughs> so um, one of the things I like to do is offer choices because it tends to increase the likelihood of compliance. So especially for kiddos who like to be in control and they don't like to be told what to do. Sometimes you give them the choice so they feel like that they're in control, then they're more likely to do it. So like kids who don't want to do chores, what can you do? Can you say, do you want to pick up your toys or take out the garbage? Um, do you want to empty the dishwasher or do you want a vacuum? Depending on what, what uh, age your child is. A lot of your kids were a little bit younger, so it could be even something with their homework. Do you want to do your, your reading first or your math first? Do you wanna use a pencil or do you wanna use markers? Um, Another thing is just giving them choices as to what they're going to earn. Do you want to earn to go jump on the trampoline or do you want to go earn the iPad? Lots of different choices that you can give kids. So this is something that I use with my daughter that I mentioned earlier that I finally figured out because she hated cleaning her room. So for her, I used to say, okay, Krista, you can choose to clean your room, then watch your show, or you can not clean your room and not watch your show. I didn't ever like taking something away like okay you're never gonna get the ipad ipad is gone for the rest of the night so i used to do just more of the choices and so once she chose to engage in the appropriate behavior then she got to have the reward and with this uh, particular situation when i first did this with her the very first time when she absolutely would not clean up her room she kept following me all around the house screaming and crying and this is what's very important to remember is she would like to engage in an argument with me. You cannot engage in an argument. I just was very calm. I was like a broken record. And just say, Krista, you can clean up your room and then watch the show, or you can not clean up your room and not watch the show. And so for her, she needed to have kind of that first, you know, what exactly is gonna happen for each of her, what's the consequence for each of her behavior choices. And eventually, when she realized she wasn't gonna get more attention out of me or any argument out of me, she decided to go, it took about an hour, 
for her to go to her room. She cleaned up her room. And then she came down and she was totally happy. She's like, mom, I chose to clean up my room. It's like, great, you chose to watch the movie. And I like to do a lot of that, like you chose um, with kids because they, it, it empowers them. And it gives them those choices. All right, the other thing uh, you can do as an antecedent strategy is do some type of preferred item or activity as a distraction. I love this little clip because I don't know about you, but I'm usually the one that likes to go up the escalator. And this is some, uh, I can't remember if it was in Iceland that they did this in, but it was uh, an experiment to see if they can get people to go upstairs instead. There's nothing wrong with taking an activity that isn't very fun and making it be something that's fun. So maybe they have to write a paragraph about something. Maybe they can write, pick something that they really enjoy. Uh, one student, uh, one little girl that I worked with, she hated writing, but she loves snow cones. That's her, that's her thing as snow cones. So we got talking about snow cones and I said, okay, well, let's just write about some snow cones. And she had a lot more fun with that. Um, letting me know what her favorite, she loves tiger blood and letting me know that she, that's what she wanted to do. There's nothing wrong at all with trying to find something that's more fun. Maybe having some type of activity that they can do in, um, some of the, some of the things that I've done, for example, is I've done beat the clock. I, my kids loved, were very competitive and they loved being able to be, to win and be first. And so I was at the timer and said, okay. And I turned it into a game. We're going to play beat the clock. Let's see if we can clean up all the toys in the living room before the alarm goes off. And so then I, I would set the alarm and we would, they would work hard and then we'd laugh and hurry and say, oh no, we only got five more minutes left to go and truly try to make it fun. And they pretty much always beat the clock and they always had fun with that. Um, other things that I've tried with my, my children is again, turned it into a game when we were cleaning up the room. And I would say, okay. And I would tell my kids, okay, David, you're going to pick up the red blocks. That was his favorite color. And then Adam, you're going to go pick up all the blue blocks or blue, blue color toys and red color toys. And so they had fun trying to find the toys that had those colors and then putting them away. So it was, it, it, it was a great trick for them <laughs> to get them to clean up. Um, you can use, maybe your, maybe your child has little figurines that they like to use from whatever Disney, like Encanto, uh, maybe they have all the little Encanto figurines. So maybe when they're doing their math, instead of having to count out pennies, or maybe if they have a homework page, that's got the different math problems, they can use their little Encanto figures 
to figure it out. And then maybe you can sing No, No, Bruno. <laughs> I forgot the name of that song. No, we don't talk about Bruno. There we go. As a reward for doing it. I don't know. <laughs> Make it fun. All right. The other, uh, another antecedent strategy is called the pre-MAC principle. It's kind of a fancy name basically for the grandma rule. So think about what grandma used to always say, first eat your dinner, then you get dessert. Um, grandmas tend to be really good about that. And then it's the same thing. So you're using what your child likes to do as reward. And this is also really good with uh, a token board. So you're sitting what reward they're going to et, uh, get ahead of time. So back to homework. Okay, first do your homework, then you get to go play on the computer. So there's the little frame for you. So first, then you just main thing you remember is another people just call it the first then statements. So first, if you do X, then you get Y. So all the rewards are basically contingent on that good behavior that they're supposed to, they're supposed to do. Um, maybe all you want them to do is to go put their stuff away. You can say, okay, first go put your stuff away, then you can watch TV. All right, behavior momentum. This is another one that I love to use. So with behavior momentum, you're using what's called high probability requests. So what is it that your child is most more likely to be able to do? What will they comply with? things that are really simple to do. So will they jump five times, touch your nose, clap your hands, put away your coat. Um, so put away your coat is the low probability request. So you are doing a couple of really high things you know they're gonna do. It builds up momentum. And then you throw in that last little harder thing for them to go do, which is the thing they're least likely to do. Um, so when you do behavior momentum, you want there to be at least three high probability requests. I've had some kids that I have to do five requests before I can give them that harder one. And you can kind of, with the, some of those, I can kind of see that they're having fun with it and they start to laugh. And it's like, okay, now I've got you. So maybe if they're refusing to sit down at the table to do their homework, then I'll say, I, I will do goofy things with them. Okay, um, let's run in place. And then, okay, touch your head. Okay, now clap your hands. Okay, now go sit down. And then they're having fun with it. They're complying. They're gonna go run and sit down. One of the things about the, or the research behind this is that it's, there is actually research behind it. It's called the salesman's tool. So if you think about a salesman, they will try to get you to comply at least three times. And if they can get you to comply at least three times, then they're more likely to sell the item to you. So they may see things like, do you like this product? Can you see yourself using this product at home? If cost was an issue, would you go home with this tonight? So more, more likely you got three yeses there. So now they'll say, okay, so let's see what we can do to make sure you get to go home with this tonight. Um, if you've gone and bought cars, you probably hear this a lot. All right, and this is an example of behavior momentum of a little of a family at home. The girl does not like to do her shapes and you'll see how her dad gets her to do it. Hey everybody, this is my daughter, Emma. Emma, say hi. Hi. <laughs> As you all know, Emma has a diagnosis of ASD and today we are going to demonstrate a behavioral strategy known as behavioral momentum that helps your clients with non-compliance issues. Emma here has non-compliance issues when it comes to identifying shapes. No. So my husband and her are going to demonstrate to you how effective this strategy can be, right? Yeah. Say bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye. Yeah. Emma, what shape? What shape? You see, she doesn't like it. She won't do Emma, it. what shape? So, Emma, look at me. Touch your nose. Oh, good job. Touch your forehead. Oh, good job. Do this. Good job. Rub your belly. Oh, good job. I told him. And what shape is this? It's a 
Triple. Good job. Yay. Yeah. Touch your nose. Oh, good job. Rub your belly. Oh, good job. Touch your forehead. Good job. Do this. Oh, good job. What shape? Amen. Good job. Yay. Yeah. Okay, and you can see there once the dad started doing some of that behavioral momentum, like, you know, touch your nose, do this, um, then she was more likely to comply to answering what the shape is because she was already in that habit of complying. Okay, so back to the behavior that you were thinking about. We've talked about a bunch of different ideas and strategies of things that you could go home and try, or well, you're already at home, to try at home. Um, I want you to think about what of these strategies do you want to try? And I would suggest writing down which strategy you want to try just to help commit yourself to doing it. So first, I want you to think about the, the behavior, then think about what the strategy is, then I want you to write down what the behavior is. And then I want you to try it, which is the hard part. <laughs> but hopefully by doing the others, a little behavior momentum there for you, you'll be more likely to try it. So I would, just as a reminder, the replacement behavior is where you're, you're trying to teach a new skill that serves the same function as the function of the behavior. Preferred item, trying to make it more fun for them have a little bit more fun activity that has same skill. So another example of that that I've done is um, maybe you want them to say they're, learn their numbers, identify their numbers. You can do bean bags with numbers on them and they get to try to toss it into a hula hoop and then say what the number was. Offer different choices. You know, do you want, do you want to do, do this or do you want to do this? Pre-Mac, that grandma's rule. First do this, then you get this, and that behavior momentum that we just talked about, where you do at least three, three things that you know they'll comply with before putting in that little bit harder thing. So I'll give you a minute, think and write down what strategy you wanna try. Okay, hopefully you were able to think of something. So this is where we get to the fun part of our presentation. This is your chance to think about any questions that you've had and type them into the chat window and we'll see what we can do. Um, we've got a few minutes and then when we're done with questions and answering, then I think we have, there's one more poll to be done. So please, please hang out to the end if you can. So I'm gonna go ahead and end my presentation so that other ladies can answer as well. Well, thank you very much. Hopefully that was helpful for you. Thank you, Wendy. That's a nice comment. She said it was great and really good tips, Jennifer. Well, thank you. I'm glad you were able to get something out of it and you enjoyed it. Are there any specific behaviors that people want to talk about? We've got a few minutes. So this is an interesting one. Um, do you have any suggestions for chewing paper and then spitting it out? So one thing specifically books, you know, I have dealt with, oh, oh I can turn my camera on. Um, I've dealt with a lot 
of ripping up books and ripping up paper, but I have not specifically seen that, that one. What I tend to do um, with more unique behaviors that are posing a problem is really try to put myself in their shoes and think about what about that. I mean, maybe even chew on some paper and just sit there and kind of think about what about this? Could they be getting something out of it for? I'm assuming that you're thinking it's more of an automatic fun function behavior, but I think that it, I have seen behaviors like this that can end up being an intention element that it's really kind of surprising because it seems very automatic or sensory based, but there, I, I would look at, is she getting um, a pretty decent reaction when she engages in the behavior and maybe take a look at that attention element and what kind of things could replace it? Like gum with something else edible in it that has kind of a weird texture. Um, I don't know. What do you think, Jennifer? It's hard because I don't know them, but that's kind of where I would start. Yeah. Do they put anything in their mouth besides books? Sometimes that kind of gives me a hint as to whether or not it's automatic or not. Otherwise, there may be, like Andy said, there might be something within the paper that they're liking that feeling of. Do they yeah. like chew me like kids, kids, because kids that I've worked with that chew on books also have this tendency to chew on their shirts as well. Mm hmm. Yeah, so it might just be a self-soothing behavior. Um, but like I said, you can't rule out attention necessarily either. Mm -hmm. But I would start taking, I mean, I would start taking some ABC data because one question I would have, and you can answer this in the messages if you would like, is um, is when are they, is there a time or specific environments where they're more likely to chew on paper? I'm sure in the presence of books, but, but if there was always a book with you guys, would he be looking to chew on that paper in every location or would it only be certain times? Um, will he, he or she sit in alone, um, sit alone in a room and chew on paper? That would be a good indicator that it's automatically reinforced primarily. Um, let's see. Okay, so he does it, he engages in this behavior mostly when he's alone and watching TV, doing mindless things. Yeah, so it it's kind of like, I like to look at, behave, when I look at behaviors in kids like this, I like to think about something that I do that maybe is more socially appropriate, but it's a self-soothing thing that you do. Um, I don't bite my nails anymore, but I used to, and it took so much effort for me to quit <laughs> biting my stinking nails. So if he's doing it during mindless things, there's some kind of automatic component. And I would focus on find, finding a replacement, something else that he can chew on that's more appropriate than chewing up book paper. And then once you find that replacement, you can even look at fading that out kind of thing. Amy, do you have any thoughts on that? Or do you want to go to the next question? I think it sounds great. We should go to Rebecca's question. Okay, I'm going to let you answer this one. Okay, so she says, my child wakes repeatedly throughout the night asking me to give him water. He is eight with Down syndrome. Should I just let him call for me? Okay, I, I think we might need to ask a lot of questions on this to get down to the bottom of it. Um, but my, my initial response um, would be, is he actually thirsty, right? We got to get to the function of the behavior. Why is he doing what he's doing? Um, is he thirsty? Is he drinking enough water throughout the day? Um, does he get out of bed because he wants your, to, just to connect with you, right? He needs his mom. <laughs> um, probably not. Okay. Um, so then that leaves us with, um, escape that leaves us with, maybe he's wanting to access the water. Do you, Rebecca, do you, um, are you leaning towards one function over the other? That'll help us narrow it down and give some more. Oh, yes, go ahead. You, you are muted, Rebecca. Should I just explain it? Yeah, that'd be great. <laughs> okay, sorry. He actually probably is thirsty because he doesn't drink a lot of water during the day. So he does try to drink a lot at night, but 
we're trying to potty train him still. Okay. <laughs> He's eight years old. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> but we're trying to take away the water okay. um, at night so he won't soak through his pull-ups and through onto the bed. So mm-hmm. now he's asking for it constantly mm-hmm. um, throughout the night. Interesting. So, okay. Yeah, so this is interesting because I came across a research study a while ago. Um, I know it's really common to take away the water, but because you want him, you know, to teach him how to be potty trained through the night, you give him tons of water, like the first half hour, and then or really a first like a half an hour or up to an hour before they go to bed. And then you wake them up within a half hour to an hour after they go to sleep because then they're more likely to have to go. Mm-hmm. So then you're you're really filling them with water and then taking waking up to go to the bathroom. I don't know if that would help or not. I haven't tried it, but I thought it was really interesting research study that talked about trying that. And they've had a lot of success getting kids. Yeah. Doing that. Can they do that if they he's not potty trained at all during the day either? So oh, okay. I'm not sure if I mean. So that might be we're working on it, (laughs) (laughs) but I'm just up all night and it's just exhausting. My husband's like, just leave him alone. Let him just keep calling for you and he'll go back to bed. But I feel bad because if he's dying of thirst, you know, I think he probably sleeps with his mouth open and needs to get his mouth wet. Yeah. Could Um, you have a water bottle by his bedside and just redirect him to that? He does have one, um, but he wants me to give it to him. Ah, okay. So there might be an attention component there, right? That's what I'm thinking. Huh. Okay. Yeah, that's tricky. And and what's the bigger battle, right? Like <laughs> how many times that he gets out of bed, he's losing sleep, you're losing sleep. Um, and that probably addressing, I would suggest addressing that first before um, yeah, taking away the water, worrying about the potty training. Um, Andy, what do you think? I- I would be curious if you gave him like all the water he needed in there or had his dad go get him the water, if it would change. Cause if it's about you getting him water, um, I just went through this whole process of something with, with someone else actually. And it was really interesting cause it's like everything you're describing, but it turned out to be this huge game of attention and this particular child was having a hard time staying asleep. So there is, you know, a biological component there. And I would definitely suggest, I, you've probably already talked to your doctor. So, um, but I would say I would start with just, um, with giving him as much water as he wants, but maybe have your husband do it instead and see if that, that might take care of the problem. If it's about attention from you, if the problem persists, then you're going to be looking at other functions or other reasonings behind that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Well, another thing too, super nanny. I don't know if you guys remember that show from like back in the day, but super nanny has a really good stay in bed routine that you can just watch on um, YouTube. And she gives some ideas for like, they get like three hall passes a night or something like that. Um, anyway, she had some good ideas too. You might want to look into. That was my other thought is doing the hall pass idea. Okay, we have time for more. Uh, yeah, looks like we have maybe one or two more, maybe. The nail biting one with washing hands. Um, so I'll read it. My seven-year-old bites his nails a lot and he hates washing his hands, which I believe is related to his fingers being so chewed down. He has a chewing necklace and that's help, but washing his hands after going to the bathroom or before dinner is such a battle. We have educated him on germs and how we can get sick, but that hasn't helped. Um, Can you explain a little bit more? So you think that he doesn't want to wash his hands because his fingers are chewed down? Can you explain that a little bit? Oh, more messages. Okay. Yes. Okay. I'm just reading it again. He doesn't like getting them wet. Oh, hi there. Um, Okay, so he doesn't like to get his fingers wet. Hmm, which blue? 
but washing his hands after going to the bathroom. Magic soap, AKA hand sanitizer is maybe a choice he can have. Yeah. How does he do with like showers? Is he fine with showers and baths and stuff? I think so. And he doesn't like hand sanitizer. Oh man. Things with fingers, I'm sure. Um, it sounds like you've tried a lot of things and he likes baths. Yeah, so that's interesting. I wonder, and but not, getting, not getting his head wet. Okay, let's see. Really? So maybe you just need to do it just a little bit at a time. Like mm -hmm. just put your hands under the water and out and just get him used to that and then slowly increase time and just shape mm -hmm. him into being able to wash his hands. Yeah, she made a good point. Maybe it is the soap. Is it a, is it a fragrance? Is it a texture? Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of, di ha I mean, the, you, have you already tried different soaps? Like it could be a bar of soap instead of, yeah, they've tried different soaps. And that's, you know, I think this is a good example for everyone is that, you know, I was talking to a parent, um, a few weeks ago and it, they would just felt so guilty that they couldn't figure out the behavioral problem that they were having. And, and I've thought a lot about that because I think it's so important to remember is that you can be trying so many different things and it just keeps taking more time and it has nothing to do with your ability as a parent or the love that you have for your child, that behavioral change takes time and it takes, you know, there's a real level of like making educated guesses about where to start. And just because, you know, just because it's not working doesn't mean that you're not doing a great job. So my little soapbox for the moment, I'm still thinking about this hand washing thing. Um, will you yeah. put hands in the water when he takes a bath? Yes. So if you were to fill up the sink with a little bit of water, Will he put his hands in the, in the water in the sink? I mean, maybe maybe there's just such an aversion right now to the whole idea of hand washing, but if you'll do it in the bathtub, if you try to make it be as similar as you can for him just putting his hands in the sink, that maybe over time we become less of an aversive for him and we could get him eventually to wash his hands. So she says he'll do that with toys in the bathtub. So maybe, yeah, fill it up and maybe we wash the toys, right? Like Jennifer talked about pairing it with a fun activity. Let's wash the Legos and then the Legos and your hands get clean at the same time. <laughs> it's all about getting creative, right? Good luck, Wendy, that's a tricky one. And two, you might want to consider, do we also maybe address the nail biting? Would that be easier? And then if his fingers aren't so sensitive, something to think about. Andy, you're still muted. I was going to say nail biting is a really hard one. My parents tried for years to get me to stop and I didn't stop until my thirties. Yeah, it's, it's a hard one. I, <laughs> because it, it's hard because your fingers are there all the time mm -hmm. and it's hard to have an appropriate replacement behavior. Mm -hmm. I mean, <laughs> they have like they have like nail polishes now that have like the funny taste. That is how I stopped. Really? Now, that is more of a punishment strategy. <laughs> but if you choose one that isn't like, it's not like they have ones that are like spicy. You can get some that just taste kind of odd. And I actually have one that is all like made from plants. So it's like, doesn't have any weird chemicals in it. So I, there's some cool options like that, that might be interesting, but they don't taste good. <laughs> you know, it's true. That was fun. I like doing that detective work with you guys. <laughs> Thanks for your questions, parents. Yeah. And Jack, I think you, are you still there? Yes, I am. I think we're ready to launch the final poll. All right. Thank, Thank you, you for everyone. those who stayed. Um, let's see, poll number. There it is. Okay. Okay, I just launched our final poll. Those of you who are still here, if you don't mind completing that. 
Um, again, thank you guys all for participating. If you have any friends who um, did want to come and weren't able to make it, uh, let them know that these will be posted on um, the Utah Parent Center website. Thank you again.